The title of today's sermon is Love Is, and um, love is really a huge topic. Uh, in the Hebrew and Greek, they use multiple words to help explain what love is, and in English, we do a nice little thing where we just cram it all into one word. Uh, love is far too much of a topic for me to deal with in 30 minutes. As such, I will really only be skimming the surface. Roughly, we'll be thinking of who love is, how the world has manipulated what love is, and how we, the church, lives a life of love. That is, who is love, how the world, Babylon, has mis manipulated it, and how we live a life of love. Love is a great many things to many people. We love a lot. I love my spouse. I love my kids. I love my dog. I don't have a dog. But if I did have one, I'm sure I would love it. Um, <laughs> I love Peter. I love sport. I love sleep. Don't I, Peter? I do. I love shoes. I love art. I love nature. And that's just to name a few things I love. And your list could be similar or different. But I'm sure if I pressed you, you would have one. We also love in different degrees. For instance, I love my wife more than I love pizza, or at least I should. Like I said, love is a great many things to many people. And that's because when we think of love, our starting point is usually wrong. When we think of love, we are far more concerned what love is, how it makes us feel. A far better point is who is love? Love is not an intellectual idea or concept. Love is not abstract or intangible. In other words, love is not a feeling. It is not an emotion that is sole substance is merely occupied with self-gratification. That is the Babylon way of distorting, distorting and misrepresenting what love is. It's saying, actually much more than that, it's proclaiming that love is something that only makes you feel good or makes you feel mushy inside or makes you feel infatuated with someone. That, my friends, is not love. Love, a real love, is and has always been the triune God. God delights to communicate and spread His goodness. Out of love, the Father sent the Son by the Spirit. Love entered the world. Love became flesh to put to death the Babylon way of love and to give us real love you see love does not begin with loving but with being loved or let me say it in a different way we can only give what we have received and brothers and sisters in Christ we have received Jesus the fountain of life and love Jesus has shown us what real love looks like in John 15 we read greater love has no one than this that someone lay down his life for his friend and yet, Jesus didn't lay down his life for a friend, but for his enemies. When we look on the cross, when we look at Jesus being crucified, we are presented with what love is. A love that flows from his hands, his feet and his side. The body of Christ, broken for you and for me, so that we can receive his life and his love. And if our starting point is that love is a person, that real love is truly experienced and sustained in and through Jesus, then, and only then, can we address what love does and how love has been hijacked and manipulated by the world. Our art, music, culture and entertainment are all deeply influenced by what we love or what the world thinks love is. Wars have been waged, oceans have been crossed, uh, mountains have been scaled, all in the name of love. We are so obsessed with love that we have a whole day uh, dedicated to it every year. When we celebrate Valentine's Day, we send chocolates, cards, teddies, all manner of things we love to the people we love to express our love. There are multi-billion pound industries dedicated to telling us um, what, what we should love 
or it even attempts who we should love and then it tries even more than that it says what is love really the Babylon project is con constantly projecting what you should love next um, that custom Nike shoe that new Versace bag it tells you who deserves your love that that person is in and that person is out because you know their ideas and their belief system is not culturally accepted and the place where the hammer f falls the hardest is how can you love anyone if you don't love yourself first so we self indulge spending our time and money on the things that makes us feel happy putting our own needs above the needs of others because sometimes just sometimes we have to be selfish I don't know if you heard that I just need to be selfish Babylon this industrial machine is telling you love is transactional you have to give in order to receive it's telling you that love is value-based it's selling you the lie that love is finite it can run out hence you should accumulate and keep it to all to yourself at all costs and we we shouldn't be surprised with this at all because that that's how sin works it, it perverts a good thing and disfigures it and distorts it into something that is harmful to you and to others this leads us to love in a dangerous and wrong way it leads us to hurting ourselves and the people around us it also leads us to not even recognizing what love really is it's like we are grasping at a thought seeing a shadow it, it, it's there but it's not really there this harmful uh, love that is empty this harmful way of love is empty it is always looking for the next thing or person to fill that emptiness it keeps on taking until you have nothing left and that way of love loving was put to death on the cross and Jesus was raised up out of the grave and his life is, is not empty it's full of life and his, his life is full of love the church knows this is true um, <clears throat> and it is the church knows this is true and in every way it is the opposite of the industrial machine the church the body of Christ is the place where real love is found because it's the place where we find Jesus in Jesus love is not transactional you don't have to generate love to be loved in Jesus love is given without measure he is the fountain of love a deep thirst quenching fountain that pours out his life and love so that we can drink and be satisfied and live a life full of love at church we receive his love in and by his word we receive it in and by the sacraments we receive it his love in and by his earthly body the church as we live as we live a life that is other focused love does not begin with loving but with being loved and because of what we have received we are able to give in church love is an action let's look at verses 4 to 7 in chapter 13 love is patient and kind love does not envy or boast it's not arrogant or rude it does not insist on its own way it is not irritable or resentful it does not rejoice at wrongdoing but rejoices with the truth notice that these verse in these verses love is something that you do in in the greek um, they're helpfully it's doing words it's verbs it's stuff that you do in church love is something that you do if you are looking to cultivate a loving relationship the first thing you need to remember is that you're actually gonna have to work on it um, like I said this passage is commonly used at weddings because love is especially important when you're thinking of getting married but I would suggest that we shouldn't be falling in love with our space spouses in the way that Hollywood showcases it rather than being persuaded by feelings that are fleeting at best they come and go as C.S. Lewis wrote no now no feeling can be relied on to last in its full intensity or even last at all knowledge can last principles can ha last 
Habits, they can last. But feelings come and go. And the fact, whatever people say, the state called being in love usually doesn't last. Let me say that again. The state called being in love doesn't usually last. If love is just a feeling or affection, if love is just something that brings you joy, then that feeling can easily change. And if that feeling can change, how easy is it to fall out of love with someone? Your anchor needs to be more secure than just a feeling. Your foundation needs to be more firm. And what better place to build upon than the rock of ages? Jesus. In Jesus you will receive his love. Then you can love sacrificially, even though you are both broken, messed up sinners. And in those moments where you don't like each other, where you fundamentally disagree, should the eggs be in the fridge or out of the fridge, <laughs> you can still love one another. Because your love is not dependent on yourself or from your spouse. It's solely dependent on Jesus. I was at a wedding once uh, where the father of the groom invited all the, uh, in, in South Africa they were called snot copies. It's like directly translated, it's booger faces. But it's a term of endearment, it is. So he, he invited all the young guns basically around and, he, and he, we were standing around the campfire and he said, love is like this fire. You know, you need to add wood for the fire to burn brightly. But if only one person is adding wood, then that fire will start to die. And ultimately that person will get tired and that fire will just go out. And it's wise words in a sense. I mean, it must be wise because I still can rem rem remember it, you know, so it was really good executed. And I, and I don't d disagree. I don't disagree fully. I think love is an action. We, we should be working on it, you know. That laziness or selfishness has been put to death on the cross, you know. In Christ, we, we, are, we are called to, to love one another and to show that love. But even in that truth, can you see the lie creeping in? Can, can you see it? Can you see that love is transactional? You have to do it in order to receive. Now, what if you can't? What if you can't add any logs to the fire? Not, not because you're lazy. I think, yeah, we know that, that's unacceptable. But what if you're ill? You're, you're mentally fatigued or your body is broken. How do you keep the fire going? Friends, if, if your marriage is in Christ, your love is not dependent on yourself or from your spouse. It is solely dependent on Jesus. Jesus will keep that fire going. His love is never quenched. It will keep burning no matter what. Love is not a Hollywood feeling. Love is an action. Love is self-sacrifice. Love is other-focused. And love is a necessity. In verses 1 to 3, Paul takes love and makes a series of comparisons to so show the necessity of love. Each comparison has something to do with spiritual gifts or accomplishments. Church life, as I said, is true life because this is the place where we meet Jesus. And if it's also a life where we need one another. Paul states that the Spirit gives gifts to our local church. Each of us has something of what is needed. But only together do we have all he is giving us. In church, love, love is not a feeling, but it's something that is expressed in an action. In church life... We are not concerned with the Babylon way of thinking of love. Paul takes it for granted that in church, love is being shown. I'm reminded of a story of, I can't pronounce his name, I think it's Tertullian. Well, he happens to be African, but I, I, that's not an African name that I'm familiar with. Uh, he's an ancient African church leader. And he tells us, in the days of the early church, unbelievers sometimes got confused what to call Christians. They would call, um, instead of calling them Christians, they would call them the Greek word for kindness. The two words sound very similar, and I was going to try and explain it to you guys, but then I realized I really can't speak Greek, so I skipped that. But they do sound very similar.
But there was also another reason for the confusion. And that's that even when believers were not known as people who followed Christ, they were still known by their kindness that they showed. Now, showing love is super difficult. Especially for us. Because by nature, we are not lovers, but haters. If we attempt to show love in and of ourselves, we struggle. We are more like a noisy gong or clanging cymbal than a heavenly choir. We are unable to gener generate real love or even do love consistently by ourselves. Let's, let, let, just to illustrate this, let's look at verses 4 to 7 in chapter 13. 13 and replace love with, with our name. I'm sure you may have had this before in a sermon. Um, Viv is patient and kind. Viv does not envy or boast. Viv is not arrogant or rude. Stop laughing, Andrew. Viv does not insist on his own way. Viv is not irritable or resentful. Viv does not rejoice at wrongdoing. Wow. <clears throat> That's not Viv by the way, you know, uh, I don't know about you, but that absolutely petrifies me. Even on my, be even on my best day, and I mean best day, that list is daunting, if not just impossible, just impossible. Jesus says love is an action. He says you should love your neighbor as yourself. You should love your neighbor as yourself. He says you should love your enemies. You might be asking, how on earth do I even live a life like that? And that is a really, really good question. I don't know the true extent of how you're doing today. Uh, you might be tired and broken. Life might have just been too much this week for you to deal with. The world has drained you and you are barely able to see Jesus' love. And now you're hearing you should show love to your enemies your neighbor how on earth am I supposed to do that how on earth am I supposed to love my neighbor as myself how on earth am I supposed to love my enemies I for one know my heart better than anybody at well maybe not as bad not the same as Jesus but anyway I, I know my heart pretty well I'm gonna change that I know my heart pretty well and and I feel more like a hater than a lover I confess, I find myself daily in situations where I could act lovingly and in kindness, but instead I found myself wanting to have that argument, wanting to make myself feel more important than others. I wanted to get my own way, even if it hurts the people around me. What do we do in those situations where it feels like we don't have any love and it's impossible for me even to show love to someone else. What do we do? We do what all Christians have done and are still doing every day of their lives. We turn to Jesus. Jesus is abounding in steadfast love. On the cross, that selfishness, that pride, lust and greediness was put to death. And Jesus gives us his life. Because he has loved us first, we can love. At church, the word is proclaimed and the glory of the kingdom of heaven is announced. Love is speaking to us. Love is pouring out love. Jesus is saying, you don't know how to do this by yourself. You don't know how to love. But it's okay. He is my love. Take. At church, we receive the sacraments. We are sealed by the waters of baptism. We are fed by the body of Jesus in the bread and wine. We can only give what we have received. And in church, we have received it all. We have received it all. We, his church, members of his earthly body, are called to love one another. And even in those days when we don't feel like we can, we are encouraged by a brother and a sister who shows us love and who points us to Jesus, the head of the church. Jesus invites us into a real, intimate relationship. And in Him, 
we can know a love that cannot be quenched or swept away. A love that can overflow towards others and heal creation. We can only give what we have received and friends, we have received Jesus. Let me close now by reading verses 1 to 7 again. But instead of putting my own name on there, let's put Jesus's in. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels but have not Jesus, I am a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge and have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not Jesus, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not Jesus, I gain nothing. Jesus is patient and kind. Jesus does not envy or boast. Jesus is not arrogant or rude. Jesus does not insist on his own way. He is not irritable or resentful. He does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Jesus bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. Let's pray.